going to conclude this morning's session with the uh, discussion of JGI's plan program. Thanks, Jim. So I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of some of the things that we're, we're working on in the, under the auspices of the, the plan program and also some of the new projects that we're, we're taking on. So I think the justification for why JGI should be in the middle of uh, plant genomics is probably pretty, pretty clear to all of you who are at this meeting about energy and the environment. Um, plants touch on all these different aspects of, uh, of the biology that we're, we're focused on. And in addition to just making sense, it's also an official statement of the um, National Research Council that JGI should continue to do, to think about plants in a very broad sense, contributing to the plant science uh, community as a foundation for all their, all their work. So based on this, we're going we're gonna to think, think big about, about plants. So the mission of our, of our program as we formulated it is, first of all, of course, to generate sequence, reference sequence that people can use uh, as a platform for their, their biology, but not to stop there to generate sequence and other kinds of resources that will illuminate the function of those genomes. After all, the genome is just a, a sequence of, of letters from the perspective of, of sequencing. We still have to know where the genes are, what the genes do, and how they all interact to produce the phenotypes we want to uh, understand and manipulate. A big part of uh, genome biology in the, in the animal world and also in the, in the plant and fungal and other worlds is to understand diversity. And that's not just uh, something we want to do as a scientific interest, but also as a practical matter to be able to capture the natural variation that's present in, uh, in different in wild populations, and then to be able to use that variation to improve uh, our crops or to do, to do other, uh, other practical things with it. And you'll hear from John Willis uh, tomorrow about some of the, the work that we're doing with him on, on Mimulus. And then finally, all this information is most useful if it's brought together in, in an integrated way that people can work with. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing uh, in that, in that uh, towards that direction. So the, the genomes that have been sequenced in the, in the plant world, obviously there are Arabidopsis and rice, which are the two plant genomes that were sequenced first, and they're in the best, uh, best condition. Um, but there are really only a few others that are outside of the GHI's purview. So one of the good things about, about the GHI plant program is that we're really at the, at the center of plant genomics. We have a lot of responsibility, but we also have then a lot of opportunity. This is a, a, the, the list of uh, plant genomes that, were in, that are already in, in the sequencing, not just in the queue, but in process. And I should add this one too. This is also now uh, in process, and switchgrass is about to is about to begin. So it's quite a quite a broad um, set of, of species. One way to think about that is that we'd like to understand the evolutionary history of, of plants. That'll help us to better uh, figure out how we can understand the functions of individual genes by being able to compare, say, the function of a gene in Selaginella or Fusca matrola or some other uh, basal plant to the angiosperms, where we might, it might be harder to do experiments or to work with Clamidomonas. So we need to understand the evolutionary history of these uh, genes and the functional elements. And being able to look broadly across plants allows us to, uh, to make steps in that direction. One of the things I think everybody here is aware of is that in order to, to make progress, we have to make a bunch of decisions about what kind of resource we're going to be providing for any given genome. And so this is an analogy that maybe it's, maybe it's stupid, but I like it. Um, we want to be able to get from, from here to there, from the, uh, working with, the, with, with an organism in the lab or in the field to being able to take advantage of all the genomic uh, data. So the ideal thing would be sort of a superhighway that would get us from where we are now to where we want to be. And you can think about the, uh, a, f a finished, a well annotated genome <coughs> as kind of a superhighway like that. And uh, you know, the rest stops are nicely annotated genes that you can stop at and get uh, coffee and other information. But a draft genome might be more like a path that's cut through the cut through the woods. That would be a dirt road. You can still get from from A to B, but it's not as uh, it's it's maybe not going to be as quick, and you have to do a little bit more work. And then there's a path that's just kind of hacked through the woods, and that's maybe like what a a selexa genome might be at this point, uh, where you have a lot of information. It's better than nothing, but you still have to. There's still some uh, heavy going. So we're trying to figure out, of course, how we can get the best resource for for the given. Uh, dollar, and also to try to prioritize things. And so this is uh, one of the issues that we can be talking about uh, through the meeting. 
just to give you some perspective on the diversity of, uh, that's the sequence diversity that's present within um, within the plants. So on the top, I hope you can read it in the back. The, the, the top is a series of uh, genome pairs or organism pairs. So maize sorghum is, is at the extreme left, and then Arabidopsis rice is at the extreme right. And on the on the bottom part is the same thing for vertebrates. So the extreme left is macaque versus human, and the extreme right is pufferfish versus human. And so the, the takeaway is that if you're looking at within grasses, sort of across uh, grass species like brachypodium and switchgrass, for example, uh, or rosids, you're looking between soybean and poplar, uh, that's about the divergence that we find in mammalian genomes, of which there are you know, dozens of genomes, uh, many of animals you probably have never heard of. So all of the tools that have been developed for looking at mammals, or many of them, we should try to apply those to plants because we're in the same roughly amount of sequence divergence uh, between the two. That's not to say the architecture of the genomes are going to be the same or that the way the functional elements work are going to be the same, but it gives you a, a, a point of comparison. If you're looking within monocots, so rice to pineapple, or within eudicots, poplar to tomato, that's kind of like uh, mammals to birds or mammals to, to frogs. Uh, we're sort of at a, at a deeper uh, point in evolution. And if you're looking across angiosperms, you're comparing a monocot like rice to a, a eudicot like, like poplar. Well, that's kind of like human fish. That's like the full span of vertebrate uh, diversity. And we can continue to go back further in time and, and pick up Selaginella and Fiscomatrella and, and, um, and down to clammy. But this is the range in which we have good sequence comparative uh, tools at our disposal, and we're in the process of taking advantage of them. I'll show you a little bit of that in a second. Of course, we can't do everything. We can't take every genome to the same level of, uh, of completeness and then to lavish on it the kind of uh, functional data sets that we'd like to do. That depends not just on what, what we can do at the JGI, but on what you can do through, through uh, through various uh, funding sources and the communities that work on these uh, species. But there are certain genomes that people, that a lot more people work on. These are the flagships, they were often the ones that were sequenced first because they had the largest communities coming to their, uh, uh, to their support. And because they were done first and because they have large communities, they're the ones that we're going to be starting on to add to layering on functional information onto the genomes. That's not to say that we're not going to get there for for uh, your genome that may not be on this list at this moment. But the ones that we're going to start with are, are are here. And I think as we learn how to do this better for these flagships, that'll trickle down to all the other uh, uh, data sets that the JGI generates. So don't think of these as an exclusive club. Think of these as the um, as probably some Reaganomics. Uh, analogy to make, which is probably not a good one. Um, so, Pyanomonas, Fiscomatrella, Poplar, the first plant, the JGI uh, sequence, Sorghum, a model for all the C4 um, uh, grasses, uh, soybean, and then there's a couple of placeholders that we haven't yet figured out what, what are we going to make as, our, as additional models. <coughs> so, many of you may know that in the, in the human world, or in the human genomics world and the human biology uh, world, there's a project called ENCODE. And that's a, an acronym, a clever acronym that stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. The idea there is, okay, now we have the human genome, we know it at a very high level of, of accuracy. What are the functional elements within it and what do those functional elements do? And so the ENCODE project is a communi community project that is funded by many grants for, from the NIH, um, where the, the goal is to to develop high, through, high throughput approaches to characterizing DNA sequence. That may be doing transcriptomics, that may be looking at epigenetic marks on, on genomes of various types, it may be testing uh, sequences to see whether they're promoters, to try to do a full court press on functional elements in human. And what we have in mind here is lagging behind that effort and, and motivated and, and uh, enlightened by that effort to try to do some of those same things and maybe things that might be uh, unique to plants to illuminate these genomes as well. So the C4 grasses are a, a special group to us because they're so good at uh, fixing carbon dioxide and producing uh, biomass. And the, the first of the C4 grasses that JGI sequenced was the sorghum genome, which was just published uh, earlier this year. And so there's a bunch of reasons why it was the, uh, the, the, the first one that we selected. I'd like to show you in the course of a series of, of slides why this is a good foundational genome for understanding all the C4 grasses to give you some sense of, of how we 
might use comparative genomics and also other kinds of data sets to, uh, to sort of illuminate what's going on in this whole, in this whole group inc that includes sugarcane, miscanthus, and then more distantly, um, switchgrass. So here's a picture that, that shows you some of the challenge of, of sequencing plant genomes and some of the potential uh, pitfalls. So what you're seeing here is, is uh, sorghum chromosome 3. Um, the whole genome is about 750 million bases uh, long and about 10 equally sized chromosomes. So this is about, about 100 uh, megabases. And what you can see on the top is that, that in the middle, there's this big uh, blue blob with, in the very middle, uh, an orange uh, valley. Those are the, the highly, highly prevalent re repetitive sequences in sorghum. And while they have distribution all the way across the, the arms of the chromosomes, they're concentrated in the center. That big bump in the center, that big bolus of repetitive elements, that's the, uh, essentially the non-recombining part of the chromosome. It's the, the, with the centromeric repeat right in the middle. And if you look at where the, where the genes are, that's shown in this track here, the place, places where the, this track is orange and red, that's where most of the genes are. So there's a gene poor region in the center, and then there's a gene-rich region in the, in the arms. So if there was a way for us to target that gene-rich region in the arms, and all we cared about was the protein-coding genes, we might go after that preferentially. But this kind of organization is the kind of thing that we're starting to learn by, by looking at multiple plant genomes. And it may not be a universal feature. In fact, if we know that if we look at, at the maize genome, it doesn't have the same kind of organization that the repeats scattered throughout. That makes it a much more challenging sequence to, to work on. And it means that for each of the different kind of, uh, each of the different genomes we do, we're gonna have to be thinking about global uh, chromosome structure, especially as we try to use the cheapest and, um, and quickest technologies. One of the interesting things about uh, sorghum, so I showed you that there, so sorghum is maybe twice the size of the, of the, um, the rice genome. And it turns out that most of the difference between rice and sorghum is in that middle uh, section. So here's a comparison of sorghum chromosome 4 on the x-axis and rice chromosome 2. And what you can see is that as you walk along the chromosome 4 of sorghum, you're basically following the genes that are present along chromosome 2. Except for this region in the middle, which is this paracentromeric uh, repeat region that I, just, that I just showed you, where the genes start to become less dense within sorghum, when they're still pretty relatively closely packed in rice. And then over at the top there, you can see that there's been an inversion. So except for these larger scale chromosomal events, what's happened is you can think about the sorghum genome as essentially the rice genome with a bunch of stuff shoved in the, in the, in the paracentromeric region. Whether this is going to turn out to be a general feature of all these grass genomes, we have an N of 2 to extrapolate from, and now we've got a brachypodium, and soon we'll have, we'll have others. So we're going to really understand this, I think, in the same way that people understand now mammalian genome evolution. This may be a little bit more technical, but if I look at the gene structures, the, intra, the exon intron structure of a sorghum gene, and I compare it to the corresponding gene in rice, it turns out that the introns are at exactly the same positions, 99% of the time, 98%. Of some huge fraction, I would imagine that some of that 2% where they're different is gene modeling artifact. Okay. And not only are they in the same position, but they're roughly the same length. So if I have a short intron in rice, I have reason to believe that it's going to be a short intron in sorghum. Now, I don't have to guess anymore because I have the sorghum genome. But this is the kind of inference that we can now extend to the switchgrass genome because that's also encompassed in this larger, in, this, in the same group of, of, uh, of grasses. And then in that way accelerate the kind of uh, experiments that people do by giving you prior information. But we know that a short intron is likely to be, a short intron on one grass is likely to be short in all the others. And that's consistent with the idea that this gene space, this region here, uh, spans about the same uh, amount of sequence and possibly in, in all grasses per, per base genome. All right, so I can show you a bunch of pretty pictures and these are summarized in, this, in the sorghum paper. How do you actually get in and work with this uh, sequence to do your own, your own analyses and your own experiments? Well, we've been developing a series of, of tools to do this that we call phytosome. Um, and the idea is that this should be a hub for plant genomics. Of course, bioenergy plant genomics because we're a bioenergy uh, research uh, entity, can't say center, um, but, but 
I think you, you, you've seen here that we can't say just because rice is not necessarily a, developed as a biofuel crop that it has no role to play in understanding uh, those genomes. We have to think broadly. We have to think uh, coherently about all the, all the plants if we're going to do this. And so there's a series of tools that uh, David Goodstein, who was um, helping me get into this computer, has, uh, has helped put together with the, with the Phytosome team. Uh, it includes genome browsers, and that's uh, sort of a, a basic feature that we have to have. I'll show you some examples of that. We've developed uh, gene families, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those as well. These are comparative genomics tools that are built on the VISTA tools that Ina Dubchak and her team developed for mammals. Remember I told you that we can use those same kinds of tools because we're at the same um, divergence. We're in the process of generating for many of these genomes, many of the proposals that you guys have, have been submitting, to look at genetic diversity, sequence level variation. And so we're taking advantage of tools that have already been developed in the, in the human genome world uh, to work with those. There's the ability to do complex queries through something called Biomart, which we can talk about. Uh, and then building on, uh, again, on human tools to do customized analyses, to be able to take data sets that are all part of this genome annotation and then to be able to work with them in a coherent fashion and, and do something that might be tailored to your specific questions rather than the bulk kind of analyses that we might do uh, for, for publication, for example, or that some, one group might care about but another group might not. We have in mind doing then workshops to systematically annotate the gene complements of plants rather than to work with individual genomes to sort of say, here are the genes that are involved in cell wall biosynthesis across all grasses. Maybe there are uh, several hundred gene families that are involved in that process. Rather than annotate those several hundred genes independently in each of the different grasses we do, to wait till we have a critical mass and then to say this is the, this is the core uh, gene machinery that was in the, in the last common ancestor of all grasses and use that as our organizing principle to use those evolutionary uh, features. So here's a little bit of a picture of what the, the sorghum uh, genome looks like. This is one of those regions that, that has a lot of genes and it doesn't have a lot of repeats. Um, so you can see that top track is the, is the repeats, the red is the genes, and you can see in this case that we have quite a bit of ESTs from sorghum, maize, and sugarcane. This is of course just the beginning because we're going to be adding on lots more, we, the larger community, as these new uh, cheaper technologies come in, come in line. And you can see here that this is the rice track. You can see there's a lot of conservation with rice as, as I was uh, advertising. <laughs> I mentioned the, the ESTs. This is uh, data not for uh, a grass, but for a frog. Um, that was that were uh, it's a project that we're working on. It wasn't data that was generated at the JJ, but we've been analyzing it. And what you can see here, this is Selexa data for uh, the transcriptome of Xenopus. And you can see that the ESTs are a lot smaller here, but you can also see that by using the pair data, we can actually uh, validate a lot of the uh, introns. And you'll hear talks. You'll hear a talk uh, tomorrow afternoon by Sabia Merchant on work that she and Matteo Pellegrini are doing, uh, trying to make all of this uh, more quantitative. And so I think this is just the beginning. The the ESTs that we've been sort of uh, scrambling for over the last few years are going to just be things that we'll do as a matter of course at a very big scale, so that every gene is covered um, hundreds, if not thousands, of times. This is another way of, of looking at the conservation. You can see that uh, curve in the middle here with the blue and the, and the gray. That's indicating conservation at the DNA level between sorghum and rice. And you can see that between sorghum and rice, the conservation is mostly in the, in the uh, introns. There's a little bit of conservation outside that's shown in, in gray. And some of that is gonna, be, is gonna assist us in, in uh, better modeling the genes. Some of that is gonna be functional uh, elements that we'd like to be developing a program to test. So our plans for, for function are still still developing. I think focusing on these flagships is the way we have to have to start. So we're trying to work on pilots in this year of what kinds of things could we do for those flagships. I think Arabidopsis has to be an honorary flagship for us because um, it's the even though JJ wasn't directly involved in sequencing it, we're, it's it's the it's the <coughs> preeminent plant model. And then well, hopefully as this proceeds, we'll be able to synergize with the synthetic biology. Uh, capabilities that you might you might hear later about, and to try to do this in a way that will eventually get us five years out to some really clear understanding of the functional uh, annotations of these genes. One way to do that is by phylogenetics. That we don't need to wait for new technologies. We're doing that uh, right now, 
And this is showing you kind of a complicated figure that compares the proteomes of poplar and rabidopsis, sorghum and rice. Sorghum and rice are grasses. Poplar and rabidopsis are rosids. And you can see right here in the middle, there's about almost 10,000 genes that are present in all of these genomes that we can phylogenomically say are descended from the same gene and the common ancestor. And so that becomes then the nucleus, the core of the plant uh, gene complement. And we're working to do this systematically all throughout the, uh, the plant tree, not just in comparing, for example, rosids to grasses. And that's a large part of what uh, which phytosome is about. And it's important to do this because in doing this, we're going to figure out the differences between different kinds of, uh, kinds of clades. So this is, of course, it, all it takes is just for a few genes to be different. And you can have uh, dramatic phenotypic differences. But there are also these larger trends that extend uh, over, over, um, uh, over, over evolution. And so I'm showing you here just a couple of, uh, of trees. Not, not that you should absorb any of this, but um, for example, if you look at, C, at CSLF, this, these are the um, cellulosynthase-related uh, uh, genes. That whole clade F, even though you can't see it, that's only present in grasses. Okay, so. Uh, issues that are related to the uniqueness of grass cell walls, they may be tied up in these gene families that are dramatically expanded. That's kind of a, a crude signal that we can look for and start to prime the pump for people doing uh, experiments. This is a similar kind of a thing for glycosyl transferases. Again, these cell wall enzyme genes are sort of the natural place for us to start, but we'd like to do something comprehensive across all plant function because everything is, uh, everything is connected. The system is the, is the problem. We can start to use these DBSTs as a way of quantitating uh, differences. So this is an Arabidopsis project with, with Joe Ecker that he may, he may mention in his talk uh, this afternoon. But these are two different EST sets t taken with 454. And one thing you can see is that in comparison to the Selexa data, these ESTs uh, span multiple uh, exons. Sometimes they actually cover the entire, uh, the entire transcript or a good fraction of it. But by comparing these two different, uh, these are two different accessions, two different ecotypes of, of Arabidopsis, we find a gene that's expressed in one of the ecotypes because it has sequence there that's not expressed in the other. So this is a very crude way of doing you know, what people used to do with microarrays, but now you can do in a quantitative fashion with Selexa or with 454. And so these are, this is, I think, probably the simplest way you can think of to add functional information. Just look whether the gene is expressed up or down under a given set of conditions. What this points out is that you can't just say in Arabidopsis, what happens on a, if, I, if I work under these conditions? Because different Arabidopsis plants derived from different locations around the world are going to have different, uh, different isoforms of their, of their genome, and they're going to function differently. So it's another layer of complexity to add on. So I want to end with what we're doing in, in trying to think about how to get access to these genomes using the, the latest uh, technology. Here's a slide that shows you in, in human genome equivalence um, how much it costs to get a, a decent human genome. And of course, as you go further and further in time, what decent means becomes uh, less and less uh, uh, specified. And when, we, when we sequenced the genome in, in 2000, we had a very specific goal of very high quality finish to the, to the letter of the law, trying to get every base as, as good as we could. Uh, and as these costs are, are dropping, this is kind of a Moore's Law exponential uh, drop in, in cost, the nature of what it means to sequence a human genome changes. We're in a little bit of a different situation here because while the human genome has been available and in high, high quality form for several years, and now the question is how do we sequence a bunch of individuals knowing what the reference is. We're, we're in a position where we don't have reference sequences for the plants that we need. So the question is can we use that same technology to figure out how to treat sorghum as a reference for switchgrass? Is that possible? Or what does it take to do that? And how do we sort of uh, keep from sliding into this, into this world where the sequences are very short before we have generated our reference uh, sequences? So you've already seen this. This is the, the, the current JGI uh, uh, capacity. We've distributed among these different instruments and we're actively experimenting with different ways of using them for, for plant genome. Uh, sequencing. One of the challenges of plant genomes, as you saw in the, in the sorghum uh, case, is that there are regions of the genome that are highly repetitive. And these repeats tend to be long uh, terminal repeat retrotransposons or other kinds of 
uh, large repetitive elements that can be you know, 10 kilobases long. And what I'm showing you here are two of the retro elements that are common within, within maze. And the color code is telling you how similar different copies of those repeats are throughout the genome. So 100% identity would be shown in, in, uh, in red and 96% uh, identity is shown in yellow. The basic point here is that these, these sequences are repetitive in the genome, but they're distinguishable. My two different copies of this repeat doesn't mean that I can't figure out how to assemble them. It just means that I have to be very careful. And I have to look for those few percent of differences between those copies that tell me that this is the one that's on chromosome 3 and this is the one that's on chromosome 10. Of course, I have to do that not knowing the whole repeats. I have to do that knowing little, little bits and pieces of, of uh, sequence that the, the shotgun sequencing method uh, generates. So I have to be able to distinguish two sh shotgun reads that might only be a few percent different from each other and might only be a couple hundred bases long. So if you think about that, if I have two reads that overlap by 100 bases, and they have to be, I have to know whether they're 2% different from each other, I have to have an error rate that's, that's about 2%, or maybe 1%, because both of them can make errors. So we start, we're starting to push the limit of what you can do when you're required to detect alignments of reads um, that, are, that, are, uh, that are that short. There was a question about the Selexa, about the 454 pairs. This is real data from, uh, from 454, a project that we've been working with them on, um, that shows the size of the inserts. I think, Christian, I think you asked about this. Um, so this is their sort of long pairs between 15 to 20 is the, is the attempt. In practice, we're getting these very nice uh, 10 kb and, and almost 14 kb. Um, distributions that are very tightly peaked. And it's that peak that's, it's the sharpness of the peak that's also important. We want to be able to get over these retro elements. We want to know roughly how far we've, we've gone. Okay, so this is, I think, very encouraging for this kind of uh, data. Of course, if I have long rafts of repeats, I'm not going to be able to make any progress because I hop over one and I land in another. Okay. And that's shown here uh, in a diagram about an attempt to assemble an Arabidopsis uh, sequence without knowing about the Arabidopsis reference. So this is an Arabidopsis genome from Cape Verde Island off the coast of Africa. I've never been there. I hear it's nice. Um, and this is a, a divergent uh, accession of Arabidopsis, the same species. And working with 454 and Joe Ecker's group, we, we uh, generated enough data to be able to do a de novo assembly of this. And then, of course, since they're the same species, we can align the sequence from Cape Verde Island against the reference genome from, um, from the Arabidopsis Genome Project. And what you see here is, is that alignment done on a big scale. So whenever you see a block that's aligned from blue to red in rainbow order, that means that that alignment is collinear between the de novo assembly with 454 and the reference genome. And so you can see that this chromosome is recovered in about uh, six to eight different major pieces. And there's collinearity as we expect. This is a zoom in on it. The context size is about 30 or 40 uh, kilobases. So that looks good. And where it all falls apart is in the middle. That's the centromere. Now, if you remember when I showed you the sorghum uh, analysis, that was the place that was chock full of repetitive sequences. So Arabidopsis has that same feature. And this is kind of a, a toy version of what we are and are not going to be able to, to do if you have a sequence that's like a rice euchromatic arm or sorghum euchromatic arm. Or, or Arabidopsis, you're going to be able to get you know, multiple megabases of sequence. But if you get into these complicated repetitive sequences, that's where there's still a challenge. That's this middle place where everything is fragmented into little, uh, little tiny pieces that don't form these nice rainbows. Of course, in some cases, you might not need to sequence something from scratch. You might have a reference genome. And, we're, we're part of the larger maze uh, sequencing consortium. This is the one that's being sequenced by Sanger Sequencing at, at WashU and its, and its affiliates, Coles Bloom Harbor and uh, University of Arizona. Rod Wing is going to tell you about uh, his work on rice, but he's part of this uh, consortium as well. And this is Missouri 17. It's another inbred line of maize, both the same species. And if you make a hybrid, you get this much more robust uh, ear. And so this hybrid vigor is something that people would like to understand. So this is the reference genome that's being done with, with, with uh, Sanger. We're trying to figure out what we can learn using next generation sequencing from Missouri 17. And we're learning a lot. I don't really have time to, to, to go through this here. Um, but one thing I, wanna, I want you to, to leave you with 
is the idea that even though this genome is large and repetitive, we can use 454 sequence to get very highly accurate uh, SNP and other uh, information. So you can easily distinguish, even though I've uh, it slid over a little bit at the bottom, bottom row, that position where there are all A's in the shotgun sequence relative to the G in the reference, that's clearly a single nucleotide variation between the scrawny version on that side and the, the fat uh, ear on the, on the other. And then there's the thing circled in red. That's a place where there's a G inserted in one of the sequences, but there's no, there's no base in the reference and there's no base in any of the others. Okay. That's clearly a sequencing error. It's only found in one of the reads and not the others. So as, as we start doing more and more of this resequencing, it's this kind of logic that says if I find corroborated differences, those corroborated differences are likely to be real, and we can make that quantitative, and this is uh, very, very accurate. Well, better, I think, than, uh, than almost any human being or comparable to it. How far can you push this? Well, of course, we have some really big genomes we'd like to sequence. So Miscanthus is seven and a half gigabases uh, per nucleus. That's a triploid uh, genome complement. And uh, uh, Chris Somerville may talk about the, the role Miscanthus may have to play in, as a biofuel crop. But if you look at how divergent it is from sorghum, you find that you might be able to take advantage of these shotgun sequencing technologies that, that generate reads in the hundreds of, hundreds of bases, like 454. And here's an analysis that we did with, uh, uh, with um, a group at the EBI, uh, the Energy Bioscience Institute at Berkeley in, in Illinois, looking at miscanthus aligned to sorghum. And so if we take miscanthus sequences, which remember, that's an enormous genome, seven and a half, it's 10 times the size of, of, of sorghum. If we align random shotgun sequences, we find that in genic regions, there's actually quite good alignment. And the alignment is here at this 90% uh, level. That's sort of what you'd expect if you think about how human genes al align to my mouse genes, for example. That's not that, not that different, a mouse to rat. So we know how to deal with this kind of data. These are alignments that are over the entire length of the read. And so it gives me uh, hope that for something like Miscanthus, we're going to be able to use sorghum as a platform on which we can build a lot of genomic resources. That's what I meant by using that as a flagship. So switchgrass is another, is another issue. It's also a large, uh, complicated genome. It, it seems to be, uh, from work of, of Christian, Tobias, and, and others, it's a, it's a tetraploid that behaves sometimes as a, as a diploid. And so if you think about it, at every locus in the sorghum genome, we expect to find what you might think of as four alleles. Two alleles are going to be present on one pair, and two alleles are going to be present on the other, but it's a tetraploid, so you get four alleles. So one of the things we need to do is understand how divergent those alleles are, and that's going to then color our sequencing strategy, as I've been trying to tell you with waving my hands and, and giving you some of, these, uh, some of these pictures. We need to know how divergent sequences are, so how it's supposed to be, so we know when to put them together to reconstruct large parts of the genome. So by looking at the ESTs that, uh, that we did in conjunction with, uh, with Christian, we find that the alleles are at the level of a fraction of a percent. And these different copies from the, the more ancient duplicates, theirs are at 2.5%. So we're going to use that as part of our sequencing strategy then for trying to get, uh, get more of the switchgrass genome as a reference. I just want to end with a, a, you know, a last advertisement for phytosome.net. It's a rapidly changing resource, and we've already, uh, I think this week, uh, we should have a release of all of these different uh, genomes that are, that are now available. Our goal is to stay relatively complete with the genomes that are, that are relatively complete. So not just genomes that are sequenced at the JGI, but we're happy to take other sequences. Maze, for example, is on this. Uh, um, and as is papaya. These are ones that are relatively little extra work for us to add in, but add this phylogenetic seasoning to the whole, uh, to the whole analysis and, and really help tie everything together. So I hope I haven't gone too far into lunch. Uh, I told, showed you a little bit of data from the Sorghum Project. I wanted to acknowledge our collaborators there, Andy Patterson and, and the group, and then uh, all the group that has worked on phytosome and the plant genome analyses. Thanks.